Hello and welcome to Be With Champions. I'm your host, Greg Bennett. And in today's episode, I chat with Olympic champion Hamish Carter. And honestly, I wasn't sure what to expect. It's been years since we chatted, but now I've done about 25 of these podcasts and I'm not sure I've been so inspired and educated and informed as I was on on high performance as I was by Hamish. It was just an incredible episode. His understanding of of what it takes to be the best. And he dissects an athlete into the athlete and the person. There were just so many great takeaways in this episode. And I was just simply, wow. And, And I left thinking, that is why I do this podcast. I just love learning from the best and having a great understanding and appreciation of what it takes to be a world champion, Olympic champion, as as Hamish Carter is. Thanks, everybody, for listening. If you're enjoying, please subscribe and share. You'll be doing me a huge favor there. I appreciate all the feedback, so so keep it coming. I'll get back to you all on my social media platforms. Unfortunately, I can't respond on the iTunes. They don't let me respond there, but if you want a response, um, I do my very best to get back to you, whether that's on uh, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, or whatever it is. Um, for timestamps and show notes and coupon codes and, all, and the links and everything, you can go to bennettendurance.com forward slash media. Um, anyway, guys, I hope you enjoy this one. I really did. Before we start, I've got to give a quick shout out to the brands that make this show possible. The only brands I'm working with are brands that provide products that I use daily and truly believe in. These products support my immunity, they help improve my recovery and my focus. First up, my friends at Athletic Greens. I love this company and I love their all-in-one daily drink. It's become a part of my morning routine. I'm heavily focused on supporting my immunity and boosting my energy and, and helping my gut health, but I want to do it naturally. And I found that support with Athletic Greens, a whole food sourced green drink that tastes great and there's no hassle, it's delivered straight to your door. And it's a highly absorbable powder that takes seconds to mix with water, so there's no clumpiness to deal with. I can't believe a green drink sourced from Whole Foods can actually taste so good. Personally, I truly love it. It's developed from a complex blend of 75 vitamins and minerals. It's packed with aptogens for recovery, probiotics and digestive enzymes for gut health, and vitamin C and zinc citrate for immune support. So Athletic Greens is designed to help fill the nutritional gaps in your diet. And there's a great offer going on now for you to give it a try. Simply go to athleticgreens.com forward slash Greg to claim our special offer of 20 free daily travel packets with your first order. $79 added value. And get Athletic Greens delivered straight to your door. Again, that's athleticgreens.com forward slash Greg. This show is also brought to you by my friends at Hyperice. Some of these products I've been using for almost a decade. Makers of the award-winning Hypervolt the world's most powerful percussion massage device featuring quiet glide technology. Hyperice is a wellness tech company that makes devices designed to help you move better. From handheld massage devices to vibrating foam rollers, thermal technology, and the Normatec compression systems, Hyperice helps you warm up faster, recover quicker, and simply move better. Used in professional training rooms throughout the NBA, the NFL, MLB, the MLS, Ironman, and other professional organizations for well over a decade, designed to help improve circulation, flexibility, and relieve tension. Get $50 off all percussion devices now, no code needed, and get an additional 10% off with code GREG10 at hyperice.com. That's hyperice.com, H-Y-P-E-R-I-C-E.com, and use code GREG10 for 10% off. And finally, I want to give a huge shout out to my mushroom buddies at Four Sigmatic and they're tremendous supporters of this show. An incredible wellness company that mixes shrooms and aptogens with coffee, cocoa latte, protein powder, and even edible skincare products. One of my staples is the mushroom coffee with lion's mane. And wow, I just love how much more productive and creative and and clear thinking I am. Plus, it includes chaga which is the king of the mushrooms. Right now, chaga is my favorite functional mushroom. The compounds and antioxidant properties of chaga play a big role in supporting our immune system and maintaining its function. You're probably thinking, ah, does this coffee taste like mushrooms? And I can guarantee you it just tastes like regular coffee and not like mushrooms at all. Best of all, Four Sigmatic stands behind their products unconditionally with a 100% money-back guarantee. Love every sip. 
or get your money back. And of course, we have a special offer for you as a Be With Champions listener. Receive 15% off your Four Sigmatic order. Just go to foursigmatic.com forward slash Greg or enter code Greg at checkout. That is F-O-U-R-S-I-G-M-A-T-I-C.com forward slash Greg to receive 15% off your order. All right, today I have one of the greatest triathletes of all time, a three-time medalist at the IT World Championships, an Xterra World Champion, Commonwealth Games silver medalist. He won the World Series in 98. And to top it all off, he won the Olympic gold in 2004 at the Athens Olympic Games. And I raced this man for about well over a decade. And every time I was on the start line with him, I knew it was going to be on from the gun. It was just going to be a brutal race. He's one of the most fluid moving athletes you've ever seen do the sport. Even in today's era, it's hard pressed to find a guy that makes it look so easy. And it really, it really used to kind of piss me off, to be honest, because he made it look so easy, just in the swim and the bike and the run, just a complete natural athlete. And better than that, he, he's just a great human being, a phenomenal athlete, but just a great human being. And it's been a long time since we've caught up and I've been generally excited to get him on the show. So Thanks, and welcome to Be With Champions, Mr. Hamish Carter. How are you, mate? Hey, Greg. Yeah, thanks, mate. That's a pretty generous uh, intro. But, um, yeah, no, I've really been looking forward to, to the chat, and I think it's great what you're doing. I think heaps of people have got heaps to – will take a lot out of the you know, combination of what different athletes and coaches have got to say. It's a really complex sport, and, look, it's all just about trying to figure stuff out. So, hopefully um, – people find it interesting but yeah and thank you for the invite yeah no mate well like i said i've been really excited and, and yes there's been a, if you look at my first sort of 20 episodes it's probably half of those have been just a lot of good mates that i raced um you know over that sort of 20 year period and had a big influence on my life and so you know you've been a guy that i've quite a few months now i've been writing you going hey hey you want to come on my show you want to come on my show but <laughs> largely just because of the impact you you had on my career, um, whether that be a training partner at times, but definitely a competitor um, at, at many of the key events. But even before that, I was somewhat in awe of you. You know, when I was kind of starting out, you were already kind of winning World Cups um, in those days of the non-drafting. And then you were a guy that adapted so well to triathlon when they said, hey, we're going to go to draft legal. I think you, were, you and probably Brad Bevan, um, maybe Miles Stewart and, and Greg Welsh as, as well. But I think out of you guys, you all adapted so well transitioning from that non-drafting to the, the drafting style format. And so for me, it was always, I always felt like I was just one step behind you guys and it probably took me about 10 years till I felt like I was a actual competitor. Um, so I've always put you up on a bit of a pedestal as a guy that I'm trying to trying to get to. And then, you know, down the road, we become good mates and training partners. So it has been great just to, to get you on the show here. And um, I'm very excited to be chatting. So where are you in the world at the moment? So I'm in uh, Auckland, New Zealand. Uh, obviously, kind of spent this where I grew up and, um, yeah, just living yeah, in, in, in a central city suburb in Auckland. So, um Yes, it's it's great. I'm actually uh, had when I retired, I spent ten years working outside of sport, which was fantastic. Um, mm -hmm. But recently, over the past or oh, two years, I've been just working back with Triathlon New Zealand as the performance director. The sport mm -hmm. was going through some transition, and um, you know needed needed a hand just to get itself uh, back on track and. Yeah, so just stepped into the role really through to Tokyo, but you know because that's been extended by a year and a bit now, um, I'll probably be in the role through to the you know, middle of twenty twenty one. But again, you know, just someone who I, I feel passionate about our sport and just want to help our coaches and athletes succeed, and um, just know how hard it is. So yeah, it's been really rewarding. It's quite challenging work. It's quite complex. Um, so trying to find getting the right people and the right structures and processes in place and you know utilizing the, the budget we have is kind of the, the game we, we play and so um, we're just trying to yeah trying to get our athletes as best prepared as they can be yeah I think it's great that you've you know you you left the sport and and we'll, we'll we'll circle back and look at all of these things I want to kind of step through a bit of a timeline but I love the fact that you've 
come back around full circle, you know, after almost well, almost 15 years since you retired from the sport. And and now you're in a position as, you know, like you said, the performance director of triathlon and you're back. Um, you've, you've obviously gained a lot of experience both in the corporate world but also in the high-performance sport New Zealand world. And, and to then come back into, a, into the triathlon world, has much changed? Do you feel like the sport has changed in that 15 years? I think it's a great question because um, the simplest answer is that uh, it's it's exactly the same, but it's also completely different. <laughs> and I think, um, so, you know, for example, um, being on the other side, on the administ- yeah, on administration side, you know, it's... Um, it's it's a long way from from the athlete's performance, and you you have to figure out quickly that decisions you make. Um, sometimes you get it right, sometimes you get it wrong. But um, with best intentions, you're always trying to provide um, set the sport up so it's stable, so that coaches and athletes can have every opportunity to realise their dreams and goals. Um, and on the other hand, you know. The fundamentals of performance under pressure are still the same. Um, athletes need to be able to stand on a start line and at the next Olympics, and they need to be ready to deliver a race. And so much can go wrong um, in the four years leading up to and qualifying and 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 you know getting to the village and and falling off your bike and mm. so you just have a uh, a multitude of things to pull together. And I think. For me, performance is always still about putting a thousand-piece jigsaw puzzle together. And essentially, the athlete that can be successful, in a way, just has more pieces in the right place at the right time than their competitors. And they're able to deliver that performance. And, and that's, what, that's, what, so that's what hasn't changed. Um, and so it's familiar, but it's also, yeah, really, really foreign. And, you know, in this day and age, these athletes also have to contend with the the world of social media, which puts them in a, you know, really unique position. Far, there's far more risk where they can be um, video doing something which is silly or um, so there's risk there. I mean, there's just a whole lot of stuff that they have to contend with. So, um and so as I said, it's, it's the same, but it's so different and, and it's, um, it's kind of a paradox. But that's what kind of makes it quite interesting for me because of that complexity. It's a really great challenge and our role as a federation and the role of the coach and athlete, um, if we're in sync, then you know coaches and athletes should have the freedom to do what they need to do when they need to do it and we don't get in the way and they just get on with it. Um, mm. And... All we try to do is stimulate their learning and development. Um, we test and, and critique and we try and make them better. And um, that's really hard to do because you know a lot of these people are already world class. So how do you make them better? And um, and that's always, you know, that's what keeps me up at night is I just <laughs> want to see another New Zealand athlete on the podium at the Olympics and another Australian athlete not on the podium at the <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that seems to be working out pretty well. So let's let's not have that happen anymore. <laughs> yeah, but look, and one other thing that hasn't changed, I think, and this is probably the most important, is not only the friendships that you develop, but the respect that you have for your fellow country competitor, um, coach, athlete. You know, we all work so hard. At so at the end of the day, you know, um, there's just a ton of respect, and I think that's really special in our sport. And you know, you and I are a good example. We've had many battles, but we would, um, yeah, we would, we're good mates and we'd do anything for each other. So it's, it's a pretty, it's pretty cool to come out of a sport and have that sort of camaraderie that doesn't, that endures um, over, you know, for a long time. Mm. I, I, you've touched on so many great points there and, and, and you've already had a tremendous influence on the New Zealand program because they, they won the, the team relay in Edmonton this year, right? The New Zealand team, a very, very young team compared to many of the other teams around. So very green athletes. A lot of people didn't even know their names and all of a sudden, boom, they blew the, blew the world away. Were you in Edmonton for that race when they won the, the team relay? Um, I wasn't in uh, Edmonton for the race this year. Uh, I happened to be in, the, in Edmonton for the race last year. But, mm. it, yeah, it was amazing because here is a really young group of athletes um, who 
we had a plan that we tried to provide a framework through which they could be successful sort of f- um, in five or six years from now. Um, and that was quite hard to get in place because we had to convince our funding body to, to buy that story. And that's a, long, you know, that's a long time away for them. But here was a young group who, yeah, just had the attributes of a, um, of a high-performing team and they were willing to take some risks and, and just get really, really well prepared. And so um, I, I wasn't surprised by how they performed, but um, when it actually won, when they actually won, because this, their, their victory in Edmonton um, was when they, they did start to become a little bit more known because they'd been mm. sort of at the front of some races. And so that was a delivery of performance where they were expected to do quite well in their own minds. And, and that's, quite a, that's quite a shift. You know, someone, you can go to a race and perform well if no one really knows who you are. But when it's expected, it becomes way more difficult. So mm. for that group, um, it gave them a lot of confidence that they, were, they had a right to be there. They were good enough to lead the race and, and they started to really believe. So it was an awesome day. Mm, it's funny we, we've talked a, a lot about expectations with a number of guests on this show and and all of us have kind of described it as you need enough expectation to get the most out of yourself to do you almost create that little bit of fear to get you going to you know get you know but not so much that it almost freezes you that you you can't get the best out of yourself it's that fine balance sebastian kinley put it really well when i had him on the podcast a couple of weeks ago and and and, and he described it because i'm like yeah you got to you know lower that expectation he's like actually no greg i, I need to have a little bit more and so it's it's funny you talk about that it's finding that right balance and, and trying to make you know use it to get the most out of you um i want to focus on you for the moment and what i want to briefly do is just wind that clock back um for a lot of the listeners that may not know you there's a lot of younger listeners that are, you know got into the sport more recently um i really want to give them a good background into who hamish carter is and how he got into the sport and and, and even look at a bit of your timeline um so just when did you first sort of find your passion for endurance sports? How old were you and what, what kind of sports were you doing? Well, I kind of went through school um, and was rowing. Uh, kind of thought as a young boy I would go to the Olympics and rowing. Um, I was about two feet too short and about 30 kilos too light. So I didn't realize that at the time. <laughs> um, they didn't have lightweight rowing back then? Well, they did, but I didn't really – I considered – for me, uh, that was a uh, second option, and I don't know why. <laughs> it's a pretty arrogant position to take, to be fair. But you know, you just that's what you think when you're 18. You just think you can do it. So, um, but I le- when I left school and I just the sport of triathlon was emerging. We had the likes of Rick Wells and Aaron Baker. So in New Zealand, you know, there was this uh, world class level of triathlete in this new thing in the sport in this new sport. So when I was 21, I kind of got to the point where I wasn't really big enough to hold my seat in a rowing crew. So having seen a little bit of triathlon and having had a girlfriend at the time who was doing triathlon, I just gave it a go. And it was a pretty disastrous first race. Um, <laughs> yeah, I... Because I was used to a six-minute race, I just took off and um, I got halfway through the bike, so, you know, 40 kilometers non-drafting, and I completely blew up. And um, and so, you know, everyone was passing me on the bike and I got on the run and I could hardly hardly could survive the 10K because it's a really long way. But in that race, I think I just enjoyed the challenge <clears throat> and – and the the enjoyment of uh, really testing yourself and and throwing yourself into something completely foreign, and from that moment on, from nineteen ninety three uh, ninety two, or at the end of nineteen ninety one, and then nineteen ninety two, I sort of switched out of rowing and just got fully into triathlon. And you're right, at a time it was a non drafting event. Um, it was a lot slower, but it was really kind of endurance based and you had big one lap bike courses on roads that weren't closed to traffic and the transition area was set up in a field and people were having picnics next to your bike and it was hilarious <laughs> and um and you know, I remember going to France for the first time and and 
you go to a race and, you know, in Europe it's classic because people come in out of the swim and they just stripped off completely naked and got completely changed. And, and so it was just this world of like, it's hilarious when you think about it now. And and there were races where you set up a transition and some athletes would have to run about an extra 200 metres to get their bike and it wasn't even <laughs> like considered unfair. <laughs> so it was pretty, it was a wild west, you know, and um, but, you know, already there were some amazing athletes emerging and I was lucky to sort of be part of that early era mm. and, you know, we had some really good athletes and so, um, but, you know, again, it was, I was traveling the world and I had no money and I was trying to survive and if I didn't get a certain result in a race, I would have to go home. So it was really uncut, pretty raw and yeah, it wasn't very sophisticated at all. Um, I kind of, I'm amazed actually we survived because, <laughs> you know, we're driving around Europe, driving for eight hours, sleeping in your car, doing a race, driving back. Um, some guys don't have enough food, money to buy, uh, buy lunch on the way home. But it's kind of the coolest experience because you're just free to go and do whatever you want and follow a sport like triathlon. So I think I learned a lot about just managing yourself in those environments because if you didn't, if you didn't have your shit together, you just couldn't get to the races. So it took a, it, it was really good for that from that perspective. I, I love that because I think it's that, um, and we all kind of, you and I are very similar with our background in, in in the way we grew up in the sport, and it's that back against the wall mentality. You can only go forward, and and one of the guys I had on my show recently, the 2019 world champion, actually uh, Vincent Lewis triathlon world champion um from france and and his story is much the same it was i could only succeed otherwise i was working at the factory with my dad or or at a bike shop you know i I had to go forward i had to improve i had to have success and for you it was the progression was very very quick um when when i look at your resume and i i think was it i remember the first time i ever heard of your name or met you was the isle of palms triathlon in australia i don't know if it was the national champ was it the national championships or was it one of the big races we had in australia and and i remember it because i think greg walsh was there and all the big name australian guys were there and then this young guy from new zealand came over and you just swept the floor i'm pretty sure you want do you do you remember the race i'm talking about yeah the, yeah it was Queensland? the upper palms and um yeah i do remember it um it was yeah it was one of those i didn't really know much about anything i think <laughs> I did have a good race, but at the same time, it was the days when you kind of got you got off the front on the bike. Probably the top Aussies were just watching each other, so I managed to just disappear up the road and had a big enough lead to just hold on. It was a super hot day, and um, but it was it was kind of a surprise to me as well because I had no expectations. I just ripped into it, and but you know it's amazing that race. Um, led to me being invited to join Brett Sutton's group going to um, uh, Alpe d'Huez. Mm. And you know, a month later, I'm flying over there. And it wasn't really planned. It just kind of came up. Um, mm. But, you know, these, these doors opened and you just sort of step through them. And um, so it was. It was, a, it was a very quickly kind of got to a point where I was like, wow, I'm actually quite good at this sport. It really was quick because then it was 93 Manchester. You got third um, at the World Championships. I mean, you'd only been in the sport 18 months. Was it? I mean, you've obviously come carried a lot of great fitness over from rowing and I, I've had Cam Worth. Um, I don't know if you know Cam, but Australian Ironman athlete that's doing incredible things and now riding for Team Ineos Cycling. But he was an Olympic rower, lightweight rower, so he's probably taking offence to you <laughs> yeah. calling out lightweight rowing. But, but he... We we discussed that ability to transition and the fitness and everything that came from rowing and the strength and power. Do you think that was why you were able to transition pretty quick? Those years of rowing translated well to triathlon. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, physiologically, I'd been really working on a, a big engine and had trained really hard uh, when I would, was rowing, mm. and and also uh, mentally, I'd really learnt to um, manage myself and uh, deal with the 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 pressures of getting up early and training hard and trying to eat reasonably well and all those sort of things. So yeah, the two sports don't look that similar, but 
I think the attributes of the individual are, to, to be successful are also the same. Mm. So it definitely mm. laid the foundation. And, you know, but that, that's interesting because even though I had early success, uh, I only had figured out part half the puzzle. And that was evidence through having some early success, winning some World Cup races, which was the highest level of racing back then, but still unable to deliver, you know, the, the winning knockout performance on, on any given day, like at a World Championship. So, you know, I, again, I only had half of stuff figured out and it took really through to um, Sydney for that, for my first Olympics to sort of shock me into rethinking how I mm. approached the sport. But yeah, maybe that's a little bit in the future. I, I, you've touched on something I want to talk to you about because I did look at you as probably the most consistent guy in the world and and had Brad Bevan not been around in the, a lot of those World Cups, I think you'd have another 10 or 15 wins. I think you got second or third to Brad yeah. winning a lot of those World no, Cups many, no many kidding. times. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it was like race it was, after race. It was race <laughs> after race. Every time I went to race, Brad got first and I got second. I tell amazing. you what, I never got over that because – there's nothing I could do to beat the guy. And <laughs> no matter, I tried to beat him up on the swim. I tried to ride him into the gutter on the bike. You know, he'd still come <laughs> off the bike and just leave me. for. So it was just, yeah, talk about an amazing athlete. Um, yeah, well, anyway, uh, but you're right. It was, I was definitely seconds and thirds was, and, and fourths and fifths was where I, some, I finished quite a lot of races. Well, I looked at your your triathlon dot org on their resume on their the resume of your performances and and you know sixty nine starts thirty nine podiums fourteen wins and then when you weren't on the podium you were basically it was either a fourth or a fifth it was really you had the scattered you know really terrible day obviously that we all have every now and then but generally speaking you were always a contender and you did win races I mean you didn't win. As much as you might want to have, yeah. but you all you were there and you were consistent. And I love that you talk about the Sydney Olympics, where you went in as a favourite for a medal. I wouldn't say you were the favourite for the gold medal. I'd probably say maybe Simon Lessing was. I don't know. You you tell me. But maybe I always thought Simon Lessing probably should have won that gold medal. And the rest of us, well, I didn't get to start, but the rest of the athletes uh, were favoured for a medal at least. As it turns out, Sydney Olympics was just like a complete flip. Nobody would have ever predicted Simon Whitfield winning or, or the whole podium was just like, whoa. Um, and you 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 finished, I think, in the 25th or 26th or yeah, something. 26th. And and like you said, that was like a, a real like – did you think about retiring at that point? Was that like a – I've had some consistency for a while, but this just – what was your feeling after that, that disappointment of that Olympics? I think it – it really, I mean, the way I describe that is that I sort of looked at success in sport as the mirror image, or as the, the picture of an athlete winning for me was what success was about. And that seems pretty obvious. Um, it took me till Sydney to learn that um, that wasn't actually, a, this, that wasn't success. Um, success was found far more in the um, disappointment of failure. And, and so by that, when I looked at my – I sort of uh, reflect on myself as, as an athlete – or sorry, as an Olympic champion, you, you – at, at that point in my career, I sort of put Olympic medalists up on a pedestal and I sort of felt that these were individuals who turned up on the day and at the Olympics and they were able to produce something special on the given day. Like they were able to deliver something that was well beyond what anyone else was able to do on that given day. And, and um, so my entire focus was you know, that's what I was aspiring to do. What I learned from Sydney was I had the whole thing around the wrong way in that um, – it wasn't absolutely what those those guys delivered on the day in Sydney. It was much more about um, how they d delivered themselves to the start line mm. in Sydney, and um, and so a big part of performance or success in triathlon or sport success came down to two things: a your preparation, uh, which allows you to deliver a performance, but it also came down to 
who you were as a person. And I and, and suddenly I thought I was ready, you know, to be the to win that race. But I came to learn that um, I was uh, in, was not ready because I was the wrong sort of person and and um, just not at a, a point where I could I was capable of winning that race. And so it took a massive disappointment like that to for me to rethink everything about a success and you know performance under pressure because as you said I'd been a consistent athlete but I'd never really mastered being able to deliver that really one-off performance and be the very best that the likes of you know uh, Simon um, uh, Lessing had sort of mastered he won you know world champs after world champs so for me you know an athlete's got two choices one is you can be happy with fourth fifth and sixth and that can be a, a place that you fall into. And if you get the occasional podium, you can get to the end of your career and actually feel like you've had a great career. Um, on the flip side, I had a coach at the time who really didn't allow me to settle for that being successful. And he sort of challenged me to think, uh, do you just want to, do you want to master the sport and be able to deliver that winning performance on any given day? And so we just really rethought the entire approach that I took and really changed me as an athlete. I mean, I guess the point is, is that when athletes hit these major roadblocks or disappointments, you know, I'm convinced that they are the, they present themselves as key opportunities to really, really grow and develop. Um, I'm a firm believer that, you know, um, growth, um, uh, Development and, and growth comes comes through challenge, and the greater the challenge, the more the development and the growth. So, when these events happen, you've got to grab them, you've got to own them. You can't blame anyone else. You've got to own own the situation. But essentially, it becomes a um, a key driver of learning and development. And so, for me, leading up to Sydney. Learning and and my rate of learning and improvement was not even a part of my campaign, you know. But after Sydney, when we took a totally different approach, the um, how we approach learning and and the progression of myself as an athlete became a really key part of how we operated. So, and a whole lot of other things changed. But yeah, it took Sydney to sort of shock me into looking at myself and thinking, I actually haven't got the sport figured out. I'm actually not really really that good. And I really need to change the way I did stuff, and so that's what we did. Yeah, I, I love I love that you you know you, you look at that disappointment as an opportunity. I think I think that's just that's just nailed you to the T in, in the terms of what it takes to be a champion. Is that mindset to look at? Look, this was incredibly disappointing. Obviously, you were somewhat heartbroken if you were going in there kind of with some form of expectation. You've come out. A little bit, you know, crushed. But then flipping it around and saying, "This is what a great opportunity." What do you mean by "I wasn't the right person"? And and what what is the right person if you want to be a champion? Yeah, I think the right person is um, if someone had come to me before Sydney and said, "You're not ready," I would have probably very quickly discounted them. I would have been very close to learning. I would have been. Um, let's say dismissive and a little bit protective of myself and what I believed in. Mm. Whereas the right person was someone who would be curious about that. Um, curious about someone said to me, you're not ready. Um, I would now be like, okay, well, tell me more about that. Why aren't I ready? Like help me understand. And so I see the traits of a really great champion is someone who is a skilled and curious learner. They're always looking for someone else to test what they're doing to make it better. Um, they're the sort of person that has a really good filter whereby they can take on information from different people and filter down to figure out what's the one thing here and, and how do we apply this so I'm a, I'm a better athlete. And so... The way to think about it is, I think a great athlete, uh, you've got you've got the athlete and the person right, and so the athlete can swim, bike, run, but what's the who, who's the person like? How do they operate? Um, 
what's their thought process how do they how do they put themselves on a trajectory to be a world class athlete and that's that's all about um their approach to learning mm. how open they are to being challenged and to challenge um how often do they reach out to put themselves against training partners who will beat them in a certain aspect and, and that's, what, that's what they seek out. They don't protect themselves. Uh, so, and that's part of the, the flip of how we approached it from Sydney to Athens is just a, it's an entirely different approach. And, and as I said, it was far less about the performance on the day. It's much more about what do you do 362 days out 361 <laughs> days out so you you are div- you are growing into being a, a world champion for the seven or eight years that's what counts not necessarily the actual day itself um and you know as we know uh, olympic champions are not special people Um, they just are able to deliver something special on a given day. Mm. And Mm. that takes, what that's for me is what I've learned is it's it's all about the preparation. Mm. Um, So if you're prepared, you know, you're going to be more likely to be able to deliver that race when the time comes. It's funny, when I had Simon Whitfield, who, you know, is a good friend of both of ours, and he won the 2000 Olympics that we're talking about, and Simon was 25 at the time. He was very green. I think he'd had maybe one podium at a World Cup um, or maybe it was a top five. I can't remember what it was, but it was that kind of he came in very fresh. But I remember him even saying on the podcast that I had him on and he said, and we were talking about you at one point, and he said, I was like a sponge. He said, I was just always trying to learn from all of you guys and all of you was always so open and giving of your knowledge. And he said, even I had a conversation with Hamish once and I said, and, and I asked Hamish a question. I can't. I, I don't even know what the question was. And you turned around and said, oh, "Don't you know that?" And, and Simon's like, "Well, actually, I do know that. I just want to hear your answer so I can keep learning more." And it was that kind of mindset, like you said, it was like he had the personality that was always trying to figure out more ways of doing things better, learning from the best. What else can I do to improve? Do you think for you it was you'd come into the sport, you, you'd progressed pretty quickly, like we said there was maybe a little bit of a, a confidence and an arrogance that kind not I, I, arrogance sounds terrible, but it's that, that kind of like, no, I know what I'm doing because I've been doing it so well from the very beginning. Was there a little bit of that that you had to kind of hang on, swipe all that away and I've got to, you know, become that learning type student? Was it that kind of thing? Yeah, no, exactly right. It was, it was an arrogance. Um, where, as I got closer and closer to my first Olympics, um, I thought the, the the best athletes built a wall around themselves to protect themselves from anything coming in and influencing their performance. Um, and by that, you are trying to control everything because if you can control everything, then you can deliver your performance and nothing's going to get in the way, right? <laughs> um, and that sounds okay in theory, and this is what I learned. Um, well, it's actually the opposite is true. The Olympics is this unique environment where you can't manage it. Um, you have to operate within it. And it requires some key things around trust in yourself and your preparation and your people around you. So you've also, yeah, so that's one part of it. The second part of it is, is that you need to accept a level of discomfort, nervousness, scared, anxiety, and, and I always feared those feelings because I thought they were a weakness and I thought Olympic champions don't have those feelings so I shouldn't be having those feelings and that's a downward spiral, right? But these are natural human emotions. Um, those, are, those are good feelings. Um, you know, a degree of constructive dissatisfaction is really, really, really important like you mentioned before. So these are things which, you know, we know now but, um, it's important to allow this to happen. And, you know, it's funny with Simon, you know, what sort of person was I in 2020, 2000 Olympics? When Simon won, this is, this is how ridiculous, I, this is how stupid I was as, a, as an athlete. You know, I thought that he didn't deserve it, which is hilarious, right? Because it's not about who deserves it. <laughs> it's actually about who delivers. And so 
Just think about that for a second, Simon. You don't deserve to be Olympic champion. <laughs> <laughs> Simon's <laughs> listening to this, I'm sure. Yeah, I know you. Yeah. And <laughs> this is the sort of, this is who I was, okay? And it mm-hmm. took me t- to go through Sydney to realize it's not about who deserves to win the race. It's got nothing to do with it. And how, who am I to say I deserve it more than you? It's a completely mute point. The point is, is we all have the same amount of time to prepare. We all have... We are on a fair start line. We all know what the course is going to be. Um, and so we stand there and we, we compete and, and the best person will win. So the person who wins the race is the person who deserves to win it. For me, in my head, I thought, oh, there should be a, you should have won five World Cups before you win an Olympic world title. So you kind of see, that's what I mean. I was the wrong kind of person. Um, and it took Sydney for me to realize this and, and for me to start to become a student of performance where I was more curious about learning and, and growth and actually just realizing that a lot of the stuff I thought was wrong. Um, you know, and, and that's where it's tricky. Sometimes you can get fourth or fifth and you think, oh, I'm on track, I'm going great, I'm a great athlete. Um, but sometimes you need to really be shocked into rethinking things. And so, mm-hmm. you know, Sydney was a real blessing in disguise because um, it, it taught me so much about myself and about performance um, and also just to, yeah, that um, this ridiculous notion that you need, to, you need to follow my prerequisites to be an Olympic champion. <laughs> <laughs> Can you see how ridiculous no, I am? You're not, you you're not alone, though. Yeah, yeah, you're you not alone, though. Of, oh, yeah. yeah. It's, we're, it's we're, ridiculous. We're, we're, look, I remember I remember thinking, I mean, I was training with Simon right up, we, and, and, you know, he brought me to Canada to train together, and he was relentless in this pursuit of, you know, we designed the exact courses, and yet we, he was really adamant about, you know, what it was going to take to win that. He was focused on winning that Olympic medal and whatever it took, and um, and. I, like you, I was his training partner and I was in the stands going, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> you know, we'd nicknamed him Butthead. I'd grown up with him. I'd been with him for like 10 years. He'd been a good mate and suddenly this young kid, uh, in my mind, young kid, he's obviously only a couple of years younger, but in my mind, he was this young kid come from nowhere. And it's like, how does he get to win the Olympic gold? He hasn't, like you said, he hasn't won. So what you weren't alone in that thinking and, and, and you're completely right. It's It's... Whoever turns up the most prepared deserves to win that race, not anything yep. else. And it's, yes, uh, yes. Yeah. Yep. And, and, and so let's wind that clock forward a little bit now because, you know, you, were, you, you, you went back and you, you remained very consistent again sort of in that 01, 2, 3. I raced you a ton during that block in the ITU World Series races and, um, and we, you, you were evidently still – Mr. Consistent, you were always, like I said in the introduction, you were just that guy that was always going to deliver a result that, I don't know, I felt like there was probably five to ten of us that every single race were mixing it up and on any given day one of us might win or the others would be on the podium. And But then going all the way up to Athens Olympics, I know you've probably – relived it a thousand times since you've probably done a million talks in New Zealand to whether it be corporates or school kids would you be willing to sort of give me a quick run through of that day um you know and just relive it a little bit again for us yeah um a couple of things happened before I got to the race that were really really important um um the first thing was that sounds like a, a more of a minor event but Two years after Sydney, I went to the Commonwealth Games in Manchester and managed to get a bronze. And it wasn't so much um, that I'd got a, uh, a bronze there. The, what was significant about that was that I brought this different approach to my racing and my thinking. And, um, you know, um, so, so I managed to deliver a, a good performance. It wasn't great, but a good performance in a multi-games environment, which was kind of my, my second dummy run before Athens. So I learned a lot about managing expectations and being in the village and those sort of things. So I figured I, think I, figured I had a few, few more bits of the puzzle in place for that race. 
but um, you're right. I was still stuck in this mode of um, winning a race every year or two, but then not being able to really nail the big one. In 2004, I think it was in Madeira, but there was a world championship and, um, you know, there was right. a... You're right, Madeira, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and Bevan Doherty, this is a New Zealand guy, comes yeah. along and wins it, right? <laughs> and so what I went through when he won, I think I got fourth that day or something like that. You, you were um, sixth, I think I got the results right. Six, yeah, 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 cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I... I flipped back into my old self, and here I was thinking that Bevan didn't deserve to win a world title. I've been a, I've been an athlete on the circuit for such a long time. I hadn't won a world title. Um, it wasn't fair. Um, the world was against me, <laughs> and um, and it really knocked me. But it was the again the, um, when we're challenged, we have the opportunity to really learn and grow, and so. What this when Bevan won that race, it was probably the most important uh, shock that I needed to wake me up, and um, and it really annoyed me, but it it motivated me in a really positive way because I realised that here I'd been the top New Zealand athlete for a really long time, and now there was another Kiwi who was kicking my ass. <laughs> and was I on the downward slide, or was I going to use this to really grow? And so. I really embraced, I learned to really, um, so I was quite skill. I guess I became skillful. I, I took this result that Bevan had delivered and I made it my own and it was something that I sort of drew upon every day. And I came to the realization that my Olympic performance in Athens was going to have nothing to do with the result because I realized, I came to realize, you know, that I couldn't, instead of trying to control the result, which means controlling, you know, 55 other guys on the start line, which is ridiculous. I actually let go of the whole result and I was focused on um, my goal for the Olympic campaign in Athens was I'm going to be the fittest person on the start line. Mm. Um, and so that's what I was work, work towards. And so when I, when I first shifted my focus towards something I had, had complete control over, um, I really changed. So my ability to structure my training and be really well prepared for Athens became all about that. And um, it gave me a truckload of confidence now because I wasn't actually training to try and win a race. I was training to be better prepared than anyone else. Mm. And when you have control over what you're focused on, um, you get real clarity. Like you, you start to identify what's important. And so um, instead of trying to control everything like I did for Sydney, I brought, I spent a lot of time trying to drill down onto what are the things that I can manage and um, what's my sphere of influence. And when you go through that exercise, you suddenly realize that out of a hundred things that are worrying you, there's usually only one or two things that you've actually got the ability to, to control. So it's a, it's a process of deciding on what you're going to think about. Because about the only thing, one of the things we can control is what we think about. And a lot of the time we can't even control that, but, you know, so be it. Um, so, yeah, rolling into Athens, I had a, a just a completely different mindset. Uh, I was a completely different person. When I walked into the village in Athens, um, I was open and clear. Um, I was prepared to feel nervous and scared. I wasn't worried about that. Um, I wasn't worried about the result. Um, Bevan had relished in the, the media attention and I was sort of avoiding it. Mm. And in saying that, mm. it was really good because he, he could do all that stuff and I could just, mm. I could just stick to what I was going to do. Um, you, you were and, the washed up Kiwi by that stage. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I was, I was, written, I was written off and yeah. And, that, yeah. and so Again, um, it all, none of this matters, you know. <laughs> we of think it matters. It doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't matter. Because when you're standing on the start line, it doesn't matter. The only thing that matters on the start line is how well prepared, you know, what's your preparation. And so, look, I just felt that um, walking out into Athens, I was well prepared. So when I stood, there's two kind of points. When I stood on the start line in Sydney, I remember in my head I was saying, I really want to win this race, you know. It was all about winning. 
when I stood on the start line in Athens, I'd prepared to go through, and we were standing next to each other, but um, mm. I, I prepared in my head a little dialogue. And, you know, every athlete's have an internal dialogue. We're not schizophrenic or anything. We just talk to ourselves occasionally. <laughs> 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 but I'd practiced... I'd practice standing on the start line and I'd use other races. I'd tried this in other races and I'd done this for a couple of years. But I stood there on, on, in Athens and I said to myself, okay, um, I said, and I was, I was talking to the third person, which sounds a bit more weird, but I'd said to myself, you know, and just bear with me, um, I'd said to my, I'd say to myself, um, you and I, so I'm talking about myself and myself, <laughs> um, you and I both know that we've got no control over the result today. And, and that, that's a, that freaks you out for a split second, right? So then you, you put the result off the table and then you go, okay, what, what, what's left on the table? And so it was, then it became all about the delivery of performance. And so I was focused on my dive, my breakout, my positioning in the water, you know, just just the technical, the, the very clinical, technical aspects of the race. And um, so instead of like in Sydney thinking about just trying to win, in Athens I was thinking about trying to deliver um, a really good performance based off the preparation that I, that I had put in place. Um, and again, I just separate, separated myself from the level of anxiety which, which – created um that came from focusing on on a result and and so it was it was a very it wasn't a chariot's fire moment where there's you know a string quartet playing in the background and (laughs) slow motion shots it was really clinical like and I was just delivering what I'd practiced so for me it was quite a uneventful race um but what I was most and, and you know when you get to the end of that race and you think Oh, that was I won, so that was amazing. But you know, when you think about what do I think about performance, um, it wasn't actually winning that race that I'm most proud of. It's actually what I did after Sydney that I um, feel the, the most proud is because it's not what we do when we're successful that counts, it's really what we do when we really trip up and we make big mistakes. Just a quick mini break before we get back to the show. I just want to remind you guys to go check out athleticgreens.com forward slash Greg. Sign up and get your free 20 daily travel packets with your first order of $79 added value. That's athleticgreens.com forward slash Greg. It's the journey, isn't it? It's that that, yeah. that journey and the process and embracing that journey and process. Sorry to interrupt. Keep going. Yeah. Uh, oh, you know, that, that's exactly right. Um, it, it, it is. And that's where I sort of say uh, in our sport, um, these are the things which um, I don't think have changed a lot. They, they kind of the same sort of thing. Um, but in talking about these two performances, and there's so much more to it, but obviously this is, you know, just potentially through what, as I'm talking, you start to hear the sort of person I'd become. And I, this is my understanding of, of what it takes to, you know, to win these races. And it was something different than if I didn't have Sydney, I wouldn't have had this. And, I mean, and another really key part in the race is um, we're running. We've got 800 metres to go. Bevan surged. He, he sort of surged ahead and um, I sort of went with him. And so that, and we're running pretty hard at this point. We haven't got far to go. This is, you know, this is in Athens and there's two of us left. And, um, and a lot of things go through your head, right? So one thing that went through my head was I sort of like, I thought it was really bizarre that here, here we were, we, we would, I'd beaten the rest of the world and there was another New Zealander there, which is hilarious because, you know, we we're such a small country. So what are the chances? So I didn't, didn't anticipate that. But as, we, as Bevan attacked and I went with him, Bevan kind of said something like, oh, shit, dude, we've dropped the Swiss guy. Uh, sorry, we've dropped Sven. Um, we are going to get a medal. And, you know, in a normal thought process of your head, you think, oh, that's it. Yeah, that's true. That's going to be great. But I was like, um, a, a medal had never really crossed my mind. Um, what I was actually focused on was delivery of, a really, really good performance. So 
as soon as Bevan had started talking, I sort of attacked him because I also figured <laughs> that when you're talking, um, you know, you might lose a breath or two. Mm. But the, the point is, is that what the for my ability to accelerate at that point was nothing to do with winning. It was about it's quite technical, right? So when you're really, really tired, how do you run fast? It takes a huge amount of focus on. You've got to lift your hips up. You've got to relax your shoulders. You've got to increase your length and your turnover. And so, and how does your foot hit the ground? And instead of getting emotional about it or thinking about the pain I was under, I was very much drilled into the delivery of performance. And mm. again, this takes a lot of practice. And as I attacked Bevan, I also was very conscious of holding a little bit back because if he came with me, I needed a plan that I could go again because he was going to out sprint me more than likely. Mm. So the goal was I shifted the finish line back about 200 meters. <laughs> and it was simply put yourself in the front 200 meters out and let the rest take care of itself. Now, um, and that's exactly what I focused on. And I did that because I was prepared to do it really. And I was, you know, so these are just the little things that I put in place. And um, again, it was about the preparation. It was really, really high level. And so it wasn't until I crossed the finish line that I thought, oh, uh, you know, I'd like to win this race. Actually, actually, I've all, there it is. I've already done it. So um, <laughs> um, I, love, I yeah. love all of that. I, yeah. I, I think one of the things I love about that is first and foremost, Bevan Doherty is probably one of the fastest kick finishes in the world. So you, you, you're consciously ready with 800 meters to go. You better You better get – make this a long, long sprint because otherwise yep. this guy will kick over the top of me. As he just had done, like you said, the world championships um, in front of Ivan Rana um, yep. only three or four months previous. Um, and But I, I think what I also love about all that, and, and when I had Mark Allen on the show and he talked about when he, in the 89 Ironman, he finally beat Dave Scott, you know, and it's called the Iron War and it's one of the big events, obviously, of our sport. And um, he said he worked very hard at just being having – a clear mind, just being neutral that, you know, not being positive, not being negative, just being in the moment. And like you're saying, being focused on the process and just being almost clinical. And he said, they were at the bottom of what now is named Mark and Dave Hill about, you know, what is it? Maybe a mile and a half to go to the finish, two kilometers to the finish. And, and, and Dave went to grab some water and Mark just went. And then he realized he, he was going, he, he it wasn't a planned decision. He just, went he he made the most of a split second opportunity because he wasn't emotionally caught up in what was going on he wasn't thinking about a result and it's exactly what you're saying bevan starts to talk to you you're not thinking about it you're not emotionally caught up oh i could medal i could get a gold medal mm. you're thinking on the process and because you're neutral because you're calm in the mind you're able to react and 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 you react quickly because you didn't have this enormous burden of expectation or emotional pressure that you'd put on yourself about a certain gold medal so for me that is just incredible obviously i am completely bummed not to be able to share the podium with you <laughs> I, yeah, I, yeah i finished fourth on the day and i i was bummed that i didn't catch sven i think he beat me by a few seconds at the end i was like damn it i couldn't catch you guys but i was so happy for you now you said it's not about who deserves a gold medal and everything else. But I remember in 04 Olympics and thinking to myself, that guy deserved that gold medal. So as much as there isn't that, I, I agree with you in what you're saying, but I think from a lot of your peers and the guys that you'd raced against for 15 years, there was a lot of us thinking, no, that guy, he deserved the gold medal and it went to a worthy, it went to a really worthy guy. So as much as you think that's not the right thing to say, I think as a peer I'm allowed to say it and I think it, I went to the right guy on the right day. So tell me about how did that gold medal then change your life and was it all positive? Yeah, yeah okay. Just before I do that, I think just to then appreciate what you've just said and, I mean, yeah, further example of the sort of person I was is that when I won in Athens to see your response and Simon's response uh, which from memory was of um, a genuine happiness for me. I mean, that also taught me a lot about um, the, the sort of person I wanted to become because, you know, you guys wanted it just as much as I did. You deserved it just as much as I did. Plenty of athletes should have won that yeah. race, right? Um, 
but to show that genuine pleasure for someone else's success um, is huge and that's something that I've come to learn to do and again that's as I said the sort of person that I needed to become um, and, and I wasn't that person in Sydney so yeah it's, uh, but I really appreciate that and you know that means an awful lot and um, um, and hence you know, the respect is mutual I think similarly I would have felt have felt the same if, if you guys had been successful because you were good enough I think we, we were all there or thereabouts, and it's just how things come together on the day. Um, so your question was how, yeah, how things changed after that. Mm. Yeah, so again, it's really interesting that you prepare yourself for a performance and you deliver it, and um, unbeknown to yourself at the time, but then everything changes and it's not sort of something that you can uh, quite get your head around. Um, you know, you come back to a small country like New Zealand and um, people see you in a certain way. Now, um, that's great 99% of the time. Everyone just wishes you well and I think the beauty of sport is you, you make people feel really proud about who they are and where they come from because, you know, New Zealand – particularly in this race, we'd got a gold and a silver, which was you know, unheard of for New Zealand. Um, it's super cool. Um, and I think then you have a huge desire to want to help others, even though you know how hard it is and even, know, even though you know the uh, level of despair and um, uncomfortableness and how difficult it is, you kind of think actually – it's worth the risk because the reward is, is huge. Um, the other side to that coin is that, um, you know, in this day and age, there's also the other side where um, you, you achieve something and, you know, you can be a target for anything negative associated with anything you do. And, and that's mm. difficult as well because, and it's part of maybe it's, part of the microscope these days where if you put your head up too high some people will try to knock it off um <laughs> but i think that's okay because it's still worth it because you know what it really boils down to is that as kids we were inspired by someone doing something amazing and you would have inspired some kids as i would have inspired some as simon Whitfield and Simon Lessing and, and all the athletes who achieve something in the sport. And really for me, that not that what it's all about? Like if we can live a life where we um, strive for something greater than ourselves and, and that can rub off on someone else, then surely that's greater than not having tried in the first place. And, just, and even, if, even if the journey doesn't lead to success, like if I'd gone back to Athens and not won, we probably wouldn't be having this conversation. But the point is, is we'd still have our friendship. We'd still be the same sort of people and we would have, you know, strived something remarkably difficult to try to do. And I still would want to have lived that life um, mm. because I think you do have one shot and who's to say you're going to be successful or not. But it's actually the striving um, and, and the audacity to set those initial goals I think that's what's really exciting. And so what I really get a kick out of is when an athlete really does have a desire to want to be world's best, knowing how hard it is and how unlikely it is they're going to make it, that's the whole reason you do it. Um, mm. Imminent failure is the very basis for amazing things to happen and growth and development and discovering something new about yourself. And I think – Therein lies the, the greatest aspect of um, sport and what we do because it's inspirational. And, um, and so another thing that just has not changed is I think those, those things endure, um, and that's pretty cool. I love all of that, mate. You, you summarize the, the sense of purpose that striving to try and be the world's best. When I retired you know, a couple of years ago, it was that there was always that real sense of purpose of trying to better yourself, trying to figure out, new and better ways to improve. And it was in that 
that kind of desperation to try and better yourself, every little thing you can, that is what I kind of missed. You know, I, I, when, when I retired from that, it was like transitioning that kind of same sort of thought process into other aspects of my life. But it, it wasn't as easy as that. I, I, one thing I loved about sport, it was there, there was these deadlines that you were pursuing. There were these four-year cycles or whatever it was to try and get the best out of yourself. It was that real journey towards a destination that I truly missed for a while and I'm kind of, I'm over it now but I do I I do look back and go oh, I do miss that kind of real purpose that I had. What about when I had Simon on he Whitfield he won the gold medal as we mentioned at a pretty young age and it was his real you know first big career win he went on to win a silver medal and everything else and one of the things that sort of came across in in my chat with him is that he's kind of known now as an Olympic champion that's it. And some, he even said, look, I went to the Sports Hall of Fame award. They were, you know, put him in the, in the fame for Canada. And, and he said, look, sometimes I feel like I could just rest my, my gold medal on the, on the dais up the front there or the podium, wherever he's speaking from, and everybody just applaud the, podium, <laughs> applaud the gold medal and I could just <laughs> walk off. You know, it was like yeah. – um, and, you know, Simon, he, he, he thinks very deeply about things and, and he's a very intelligent man and I think sometimes he feels – that that gold medal, he's like, well, hang on, I'm, I'm more than that as well, you know. And he, he mentioned the other side of adulation is isolation and, and I thought that was very profound. Did you ever kind of feel that or because you won the gold medal when you were 33, you'd already had somewhat of a, were you 33, 32? I can't remember exact yeah, age. But, right. yeah. but, but, but you'd had somewhat of a career before you, you had family behind you, did you? What was that like in terms of? Did you have that feeling of isolation ever? Was there ever that kind of moment of, I'm I'm more than just a gold medal? I, you know, yeah, yeah, totally, to yeah, yeah. We, we've we've spoken about this, and this is kind of the things you um, that they're not the they're not the downsides. I think they're just just what happens. I think if you likened it to if there's anyone else who's going to be listening who just has a has a job, okay, so they just they work. Um, I don't know what do they do? They just I get it. What, I'm <laughs> yeah, thinking they normal, um, job. <laughs> normal job, yeah, normal job. Um, they they fix cars. Just to say that. And one day, you know, you go to work and you fix cars better than anyone else, and you fix the car so well that um, it's a it's a remarkable day at work. And if every single person and every single day after that day, you're known for that one job that you did. <laughs> um, yeah, any, any, anyone could sort of go, oh, crikey, wouldn't you want to move on from that after a while? <laughs> yeah. and, 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 you, and you do because you want to – it, it, it does define you but, and you sometimes wish it didn't. Um, and it's, I, I think Simon and I – I mean, I can't speak for Simon, and, uh, um, but I'm, I guess I'm not saying, oh, poor us. Um, it, it's more – it's just one of those unexpected consequences, I guess. Um, and I think you've just got to come to terms with that. Um, part of working outside of sport for the 10 years was to try and get away from the sport. But equally, you know, it's who you are and it's part of who you are. And again, you can't really manage or control this. You've, you've actually just, that's what it is. And so you just, you know, go along with it. Um, but yeah, there are some, some aspects like that. But I think e equally with anyone, um, there are pieces of us which we think we'd, we'd maybe choose to occasionally switch off. Mm. Um, but again, I think it's just a natural, natural path that we go. And I still think that if we get a chance to uh, share what we've done with others, then, yeah, it's worth it. And, um, and it's something that we should be proud of. Um, but it is. It's just one of those things that you just, yeah, didn't anticipate, and you can't sort of take it back. So that's it's <laughs> a bit odd. But um, yeah, no, to... no. You, I think you've expressed that really well, and I love, I love the analogy of of the car. I think that that just sums it up perfectly. And you know, so then it wasn't long after '04. You know, I remember we were training in Boulder, Colorado, in 2006. Um, you had an incredible year in '06. You got second at the World Championships um, in Lausanne. Uh, you were still winning races. I think you won a World Cup that year. You you were still going very well. And I remember 
at the end of the year, we, we'd sort of said, oh, yeah, I'll see you in Boulder at the end of the year. And then you called me. I was in Noosa actually in the time and I got this phone call from you and you, you said, Greg, uh, I got a phone call from a software company and they've asked me to to join them and, you know, it looks like I'm retired. I was like, I was a little bit heartbroken because he's one of my, you know, it was all of a sudden you kind of aged me. It was kind of like, what? We're meant to be stopping all of this? I'm having a ball. What's going on? But it was kind of like, I mean, it was a godsend because I didn't have to race you as much in the Lifetime Fitness Series and all those other events that I that I went on to do, have some success in. So it was kind of a, a blessing, but it was also, I was a little heartbroken. So tell me about that transition because in this show I, I you know i've had simon thompson on who was at the olympics with us in 04 and he's transitioned you know pretty well and and some other people have struggled with the transition tell me about that for you like you said getting into the corporate life was kind of nice to maybe have a break from just being just being but you know what i mean no one yeah. is the gold medalist triathlete was that transition difficult for you or how do you feel about all of that and, and that big change i think it is, it is, well, it's, diff, it's, it's different for everyone. I mean, everyone goes through their own steps, I guess. Um, and it depends on when you retire and how you go about it. Um, again, it's something that I don't know if you can manage. You, you are somewhat, um, you just move in directions and sometimes by choice and other times you, you just go. I think the difficulty is, is, You've got to get your head around the fact that you're really, really good at one thing or a, few, a couple of things. And um, a, as you move into a workforce or other place, um, you've got to accept that although you've got a ton of experience and as an athlete and all the things you've been through, you know very little about anything else. <laughs> That's true, isn't it? <laughs> and. <laughs> So I think if you approach it from, again, being open to learning, uh, being curious and, and developing and, and learning to work with bigger teams of people, or uh, it, it's really important not to – you want to you bring over some of the attributes as an athlete with skill. And, and, and by that I mean, you know, you can't you, – often in a workplace you can't be um, relentlessly focused on trying to – Win everything. <laughs> um, <laughs> you've, you've got to. You've got to. The important things like um, building trust, um, working working well with people, um, understanding your role, um, figuring out when you get you know when there are problems, you, you've got to find solutions rather than blame people. Um, so so getting. Getting into that sort of mode, um, I think, is is really, really different as an athlete. And, I mean, the other thing as an athlete is you've got quite a finite, you know, targeted cause and effect uh, between trying to get a result here and I've got this much time. Whereas in a job, it's not so defined. Like, it, it's it's a, almost like an infinite game where it goes on forever. Uh, so it, it's just it's just really, really different. And, and I think you've got to embrace that for what it is rather than trying to make it retrofit who, you've, who you are as an athlete. Mm. Um, so, and, and there's a real balance. You want to be authentic to yourself, but you also want to be someone who's willing to be open to learning and, and grabbing opportunities and, and, and being that, that sort of work, uh, that sort of employee. And I think that just takes time and adjustment. Um, uh, and and you just gotta yeah you just gotta step back and 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 allow that allow time because you know if someone turned up in our sport you wouldn't expect them to be really that good for a number of years right but I think a lot of times when athletes go into a job they probably some of them think well I did I sort of kept thinking well. I should be the best at this within a couple of years. Um, <laughs> which, you know, think about Focus that. on the process, Hamish, the process, yeah. not the destination. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's ridiculous, right? So, yeah. I mean, and this is, this is the tug of war, you know, the, the, um, the cognitive dissonance, they would say. Mm. You've got to find the balance. And so, um, and this is, a, it's, just a sphere. it's just a different place to move into. And so that should be embraced for what it is rather than trying to, 
uh, overly manage it. And I think that's that's difficult for for, each, for all of us because you know it's just such a different. We're all coming at it from a different angle. Do you find you know you came back you you were with you know um, the software company and then a brewery company and 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 you stepped out but then you went went to high performance sport New Zealand for quite a while and then now obviously back with with uh, into the sport of triathlon as the the sports uh, high performance director there. Tell me what do you think in terms of high performance sport now compared to say 10, 20, 30 years ago? What are some of the areas that that they're looking at? You know, specifically, you've been involved in New Zealand. What are they doing now that's that's different? I know you and I had a conversation a, a number of years ago. Um, I was coming from an approach of more of a holistic approach of looking at you know team building and then looking at you know your general health and all the bits that go with it, um, mental strategies, and really breaking it down almost clinically, like you described your your Athens process. It was almost a, there's more of a holistic but somewhat clinical approach to sport. Is it that kind of a – where are they going and how are they improving athletes now compared to when we were racing? Well, again, I think it's um, it's different but the same. And so all those things you talk about, you know, are really important. I think when I – when I the, the direction we're heading in with our sport is um, – we're trying to develop an HP program which develops the athlete and the person. Mm. What my assumption is is that some of the athletes in our program, um, or, or, or sorry, the athlete and the person, and, and how the how the environment operates. So we've got a group of athletes that train together. So we're trying to make that as best we possibly can. Um, I think. As I was as an athlete, and even with some of our athletes now, there's, I think they see the value in the training. Um, they see less value sometimes in the other things that we do or how the group works. That that sometimes don't see the value in that, um, and that's that's understandable. I think the way in which high performance sports going is, um. So there's two parts. One is you know because we're a government funded agency um, we need to manage risk because there's an expectation from the government that certain things will be done a certain way um, and and that's that's the framework we've got to sit within uh, the next part of it is we've as a sport we've got to try and provide consistency and stability so that a we're not getting distracted by um, little things which blow up and take our attention elsewhere but also that we have as much time to focus on performance as possible. And then once we've got that stability, we can really start to slot in areas of development around understanding performance, keeping athletes healthy, making the environment safe, facilitating learning and development, and just progression on swim, bike, and run, and all the other attributes around values and behaviors, which you know we've been talking about for the last hour. Mm. You know. If you listen to what we've talked about, and I haven't listened to other podcasts, but those who have been successful in the sport, and that's not just those who have won stuff, we don't, we're not talking about stuff we do on the pool. We don't talk about the sessions I did on the bike. Mm. What we're talking about is attributes of successfulness, and that comes down to um, a lot of our, uh, well, if you kind of summarized our talk, it's based around behaviors and values and, and attributes. So I think I hope that comes through because I guess my point is that um, when you're an athlete, I sometimes I think you see the relevance is far more in the training you're doing versus the person you're becoming. And so I think the high performance space that I'm want to focus on is developing just as much the person as the athlete. Mm. And I think that's really important. And not like only the attributes around performance, but the attributes around res- being respectful and showing up on time and mm-hmm. um, saying thank you. Now, you might say, that's not going to make me a faster athlete. Well, it might not, but you can't do the sport on your own. And so how you work with others is really important. And that's going to be really important for you after sport. So these are the things that we're trying to bring forward and I think um, so. For me, those are sort of the some of the cornerstones of what's really important in a high performance program at the moment. 
I love that, mate. That all of that is so powerful, and and I think anybody listening to it is is like, yeah, he's on he's on the money in, in terms of the. Okay, so if we if we 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 dissect the athlete into two people, the athlete and and the person on on the athletic side of things, do you leave that to the individual coaches and the athletes? How much are you involved with? I don't know, doing DNA tests or any kind of blood work or or, or, or helping them with data for their sleep and recovery or, or those kinds of things. Are you involved in that tracking much or you leave that to the coach and athlete? Yeah, so we, we I believe in, um, we provide an environment where coaching athletes can learn, develop and, and have opportunities to, to get better. Uh, and the coach and athlete are responsible for, for their delivery um, and, and doing what they need to do. So yeah, we we are definitely moving towards providing um, good intel around uh, you know what makes up performance and measuring those things in the actual sport of triathlon. Like, what do we need to be doing in the pool? What do we need to be doing on the run? Um, I think the difficulty now, though, is that not only have athletes got to master three sports and the combination of and manage their whole lives, they've also now got an, an Olympic distance race and a mixed relay race. And, you know, they've got to train essentially for both those and qualify for a Tokyo Olympics. And then they've also got to be considering that, you know, Olympic distance racing might not be in the 2024 Games. So, again, the, there's going to be this period of change where athletes have to be able to adapt and learn to a new style of racing. And, um, and, and this team aspect might, well, might also change the dynamic of the way in which we train and prepare. So it's, it's and heading into a, in a, into a more complex space, I think, and it's hard to know um, how do you prepare for an Olympic distance race in a, yeah, in a mixed relay. And that's mm-hmm. really, really difficult. I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I think that mixed relay, I think, is just a phenomenal event. It was one I, I kick myself and go, I wouldn't have been fantastic to have had a, an Australian sort of team in 2000, 2004 when, when, when we had such, such numbers of Australians that we could have delivered a great team event. And I, I think of all the gold medals at the Olympics, I actually think it could be one of the most special. And, and, and the reason being, firstly, we have the, the men and women racing together. Um, and I think that's exciting for one. And, and secondly, it almost shows the depth of talent that, and, and people within your squad, uh, within your country that shows who is almost the fittest country in the world kind of thing, you know. And I just, I for one, think it could be one of the greatest gold medals to, to receive at the Olympic Games and to be able to share it and and with the teammates that, you know, you'll all go to hell and back together to try and make that gold medal win. For me, that to me is almost more exciting than the individual gold coming up. I, I still love the individual gold, so I don't want to take anything away from that, but I love the concept of the team. Uh, I was surprised to hear you say you think the Olympic distance, is that are they thinking about shortening it, are they, for, for 2024? Oh, I think just the ITU have, like all sports, are thinking, trying to think ahead and think, you know, for our sport to remain relevant and, and uh, for it to attract an audience and all those sort of things. Um, yeah, they're just, I think they're thinking about ways in which the event triathlon can be more exciting to be part of and watch and do. And so um, I, I think at the Congress at the end of last year, there was um, talk of where's the sport going in the next, you know, uh, five to ten years. And so... Um, yeah, I think I think the ITU is certainly looking at it, uh, and I agree. I think the, the the introduction of mixed relay has been fantastic by the sport. Um, it still doesn't change the fact that it's very difficult and complex for coaches to you know prepare athletes for that. Uh, but it's incredible because you know your purists could have sat back and go, "Is that's not really triathlon?" But the point is, is that when you watch it, it's the coolest race to watch oh. ever. Love it, love yeah. it, man. And I, and one, one thing that I love is I also, when I, you know, I've looked at becoming a sports director in a couple of countries along the way here, and and I've always said because the women are on the course for ten percent longer, I think any country that does have strong women has a higher chance of winning the medal. I don't know. Would you agree with that statement? Yeah, I think uh, in our analysis, um, to a large extent, 
your lead female in the race um, really sets the race up, and and uh, it's it's a it's definitely a determining factor on the the outcome, considering the rest mm-hmm. of the all, all things are equal. So yeah, it is a really important part. Um, so if you can make that front pack, um, then you're in the race. If if you can't, then you're you've got less control of your outcome. And so yeah, it is a really really critical mm-hmm. part of the race. Um, mm-hmm. And that you know you see athletes turning themselves inside out for their teammates and. Mm-hmm. Again, that's new for our sport, and I think it's really exciting because we find a new level in ourselves when we when we're competing for someone else, and um, and that's and that's pretty neat. And so I think that this is where the, where I think the sport's heading, and I think great on the ITU because it was a pretty bold move when they did this, and mm. I think as as they are their, their job is to to you know, keep triathlon relevant and make it an exciting sport to watch, and I think. That them exploring these options and thinking about it um, is is exactly what they need to do because yeah, if an Olympic distance race may 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 change, and so we might like that or we might not. But actually, what's going to hold the sport in good stead uh, well beyond us, and mm. that's what I think they're they're trying to do. Well, we like we said, you got to adapt. You got to keep adapting. And yeah. uh, it, it's funny. I look at that team really, and it's like you said, racing for a team mentality. It adds another layer of expectation and pressure on the athletes. That when you're an individual, it's up to you, and it's on you, and it's that's all it is. Um, but having that team mentality, uh, where you've got to perform, otherwise you let down your teammates or you build up your teammates. There's a whole nother complex level of handling pressure and expectations and doing it for others so i kind of i kind of enjoy that kind of mindset as well that you know performance directors and coaches and athletes are all going to have to work on the mental strategies yeah for overcoming that that fear or using that fear as great fuel um um, and the anxiety using it as fuel I, i think all of that is fascinating moving forward so you you know your contract is up you said you've you've signed a short term sort of deal with Try New Zealand. If you had a choice moving forward, what is an ideal role for you moving forward? You're obviously somebody that's very in tune with high performance anything, high performance sport, sure. But I think you could you could go anywhere with you know this this hour fifteen we've spent has just been incredible knowledge bombs on the the human psyche. Um, what would you want to do beyond that? I mean, is there any other roles that, that you see for yourself? Yeah, I'd really like to um, I really like to move beyond sport. And I think I'm a big fan of um, creating a workplace that is conducive to people really getting the best out of themselves. Mm. And so uh, in, a, in an organization, it would be like a, it's like in a people and culture space where you, you build an environment where, um, yeah, it's, it's a really great place to come to work where you can really challenge yourself, um, where you can make mistakes and learn and develop and grow, where, uh, you know, problem solving is, is embraced rather than sort of, you know, steered away from and. So those those aspects of high performing teams, I think, are, are really interesting to me, and that's kind of what I'm really enjoying in this role. It's just watching out for how well do we operate as a, as a as a as a, a group of athletes and coaches. Are we a team? I don't know. It depends on your definition. Um, how do we ensure individuals get to achieve their objectives while as a team? We have the opportunity to learn and grow from each other. So, those sort of things are really interesting to me, and mm. um, and I think you know it's again my desire again is just to pass on and share what I've learned through what I've been with that can help others, and that's what I get a kick out of. And you know, similar to you know you doing this, mm. uh, I think as you said, it's, uh, the driver is to share this information, um, and so I think we're coming from the same place and. And I think that's that's the enduring part of what we've done is, um, you know, we feel this opportunity and if people are listening and interested, then it will, it's great. Um, and so, yeah, good on you for doing this because I think <laughs> there's so much there's so much we can all learn, but until we stop and actually think about these answers, 
Um, and we'll probably think of you'll think of questions as soon as we hang up and I'll think of things that I wanted to say but I didn't say but <laughs> no it's always the way <laughs> what a great place to be because like you're just turning over rocks to and discovering new things and and that for me that's that's you know when you're engaged in a, in a space of learning um, you just feel empowered and excited and that's it's just a great place to be yeah, well, I think you and I are, are in a very similar place in our lives right now where I think you feel like you've you've managed to get all this information and it's all stored in your head. You've, you've generated through experience. You have all this knowledge that you want to share. And I, for me, I, I chat you know, with my wife, Laura, and, and we were like, how do we just get it out to as many people as possible? you know, and, and help if we can. Um, some of the people will tear us down every now and then, but the, I, the whole concept of this show is to try and uh, get our knowledge out there with, with the amazing guests that I, you know, I've had the privilege to talk to on this show that are, have been so willing to just share their knowledge as well. And um, it's just such a great platform to get out there. And um, I'm, I'm thoroughly enjoying it because it's like you said, that, that want, uh, th- that need almost to keep learning um, I'm getting through doing this show. Like, you know, just this hour that we've had, it's not only have I learned more about you than I thought I, you know, I thought I knew you pretty well, but I've already learned so much more but beyond that of how to optimize my own life going forward um and I, i'm sure the listeners are all saying the same thing it, you've given so many so much impactful knowledge there so i really really appreciate it and um you know i don't want to take too much more of your time mate because i know this i know you you before the show started you said you just got finished a meeting at 1 a.m with the <laughs> itu and it's uh we started this call just before seven uh in new zealand time and i know it's sort of a cold winter's day there and i'm sure you'd rather be in bed asleep right now <laughs> so okay. I, I i i really have thoroughly appreciated this and and, and just really enjoyed catching up mate and next time I want to do it in person and we'll share a couple of beers and we'll do it at a reasonable hour of the day, maybe after going for a little jog or something um, and talking about how good we were. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> but, hey, but it, the longer yeah. we live it, the better we get. <laughs> it is amazing, isn't it? <laughs> it, is, it is amazing, actually. Um, I don't know. We, we should talk about more about how amazing we really are, but um, that's for another topic. <laughs> <laughs> that's a whole other podcast. We'll shift that. That one will be like a, yeah. a three-hour episode, everybody. Yeah. No, we're, 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 yeah. We know everything. Sure. Just ask us. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Sure. No. Mate, it's been absolutely a pleasure. Um, now, if, look, if people want to, I, I don't know where you are with social media or any of these things these days. Do you have an account? Can people follow you? And if you do, I'll, I'll put that all in the show notes as well. Well, but where do we where do people I, find you um i don't really no i don't really do that sort of thing um <laughs> but okay. i do have an instagram account but i have i i, I guess i i look at it i don't really do but right. i think that's carter hamish yeah um, but you know i mean yeah i'm happy to share what i what i've done um but equally um yeah if if I mean, if people, they can get hold of me through you, I guess. But Yeah, yeah, people, um, get, get in touch with me. Yeah. And I'll, yeah, I'll put yeah. them in touch with you. I know there's probably a big employer over here in the US that's saying, hey, this guy's going to fit our <laughs> mindset yeah. very well. No, I'd love <laughs> to do that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Change it up a bit. And uh, I, I didn't get to mention, I, I know my wife wanted to say hi because, you know, she again, you know, we're friends from a long way back too. And, yeah. and, and no, I just want to say hi to, hi to Marissa and the kids and I, I – I believe, you know, your kids are all growing up now, which just blows my mind. So, um, mate, it's been a real pleasure and um, thanks again so much. Yeah. No, thanks, Greg. And the final thing I'll say is that for, if, if athletes or coaches are listening, um, you know, it's one thing to listen to, to these things, but it's actually – it only matters about what you do next. So I'd really encourage you to identify something that you're going to do and um, – and, and sort of act it and, and, and bring it to life because uh, the learning only – well, applied learning is where you really start to get impact. So um, take a chance and, and try something different, um, if not from my, this podcast but from any other one that Greg's have done because that – I think that's where you really start to see change. And um, so I just encourage people to, yeah, just to, to make, make a decision and do something if they feel that it can help them improve. Mate, that's the best ending 
I've had on any of the podcasts. And honestly, probably this has been the most inspirational, I think, podcast episode that I've done out of the 25, 26 or whatever I'm up to. You, you, you really incredible, mate. Much appreciated. Stay on the line. Thanks everybody for listening. If you want to look at timestamps, show notes or whatever, they'll be on the website. Um, but again, thanks everybody for listening and thank you. Hamish Carter. Amazing. Mate. Thanks. Cheers. Jim. Cheers. Thanks a lot for listening to Be With Champions. If you enjoyed the show, your support would truly be appreciated. You can visit the Be With Champions Patreon page or you can subscribe with your podcast app of choice. Don't miss the next episode, so subscribe and be notified. For show notes, if you want to know more, please visit bennettendurance.com. I'm Phil Liggett, and on behalf of Greg Bennett, here's to the next time, and I hope you will join Greg again very soon.